Hi guys, welcome to part two of the series of videos in understanding the Loran C. Loran, as you know, stands for long range navigation and you should have watched part 1A and part 1B before watching this part. So in part 1A, we tried to understand uh, quickly the hyperbolic system of a navigation and in part 1B, we try to understand the transmission of the radio waves and how it forms a hyperbolic system through which uh, we can uh, get a line of position for plotting the ship's position at sea. In this video, I'm going to put together the theory learned from parts 1a and 1b into understanding how the Lorentz operates. Now, if you have not watched part 1 and b, I suggest you do that, but uh, I will quickly also give you a um, kind of a quick recap on what we have learned so far in parts 1a and parts 1b. Uh, in the next video will be part 3 and the last part in the series of videos on Lorentz C and that will discuss the errors and corrections of the Lorentz C as an instrument. So the Lorentz uh, stands for long range navigation and this uh, Lorentz C system uh, is based on a hyperbolic position line system uh, which further is based on the time differences in reception of signals broadcasted at a low frequency of 100 kilohertz. The stations are divided into chains and each chain is has a master and two more slaves. A single station may be part of more than one chain and each chain has a unique group repetition interval which we'll talk about later on. So the Lorentz C receiver recognizes the desired chain signal because they are repeated at this interval. Now since the speed of transmission remains constant, the distance to the transmitting stations can be calculated knowing the time interval from transmission to reception. However, to do this, uh, it would require you to know the time of transmission and the reception of the signal from the master and the slave stations and then calculate the difference of distance to find which position line your ship is on. A simpler solution that does not require you to know the time accurately is to accurately measure the time difference between the arrival of the signals from the master and the slave stations. This could be converted to a range difference and a hyperbolic position line found. The hyperbola could just as easily be labeled with time difference measurements and this is the system used by Lorentz C. Now in part 1a and part b, we understood how the basic structure of the hyperbola works in terms of range determination and distance determination. And 1b, we understood how the transmission of the radio waves becomes essential in uh, not having any ambiguity and position plotting. So I'll tell you what the ambiguity was. So if the master and the slave station transmit simultaneously, so a hyperbola system could still be generated based on the time difference in the reception of the master and slave pulses. Now nearer to the master station, the master transmission would be heard first and nearer to the slave station, the slave would be heard first. Now on the perpendicular bisector of the baseline, the pulses would be heard simultaneously. Now this system, however, will have two major disadvantages. On or close to the bisector where the pulses overlap, the receiver would receive only one pulse and would be unable to measure any time difference. Further away where small time differences could be measured, the receiver may be unable to identify whether it was receiving the master signal or the slave signal. Thus, there is a zone of ambiguity. And that is why we learned in part 1b that there should be some delay from the transmission of the signal from the master and the slave station. So to remove the ambiguity, the slave transmission is delayed by a sufficient time for the master signal to be received before the slave throughout the coverage area. The second slave is delayed even longer so that the first slave is received before the second and so on. These delays are made up of two parts, the primary coding delay 
is the time taken for the master signal to travel along the baseline to the slave and the second recording delay is the additional delay by each slave. We'll talk about each of these in further as well. So the secondary coding delay also ensures that any ambiguity due to the overlap of the master and the slave transmission nearer the slave or nearer to the slave station is resolved. Thus the transmissions are always received in the order master and then slave. Further delays are introduced to subsequent slave transmissions to ensure that the transmissions are always received in the same order wherever the operator is within the coverage of a particular chain. So a particular chain will comprise of one master and two to three to four slaves. All right. Now, how is the chain identified? Chains are identified by their group repetition interval, which is the time between the start of a master station's group of pulses and the next start of the master station's group of pulses. I'll show you in a diagram. I'll show you what I mean by uh, the group repetition interval and how it is identified. All right. Now, what happens is that, uh, like I said, if the master and the slave transmit simultaneously, the problem is that uh, a fundamental line of position ambiguity in the vicinity of the center line would exist. And I'll show you that this could cause an error in the position. So imagine this A is nominated as the master station and transmission of B is delayed until the arrival of pulse from A. However, if this transmit simultaneously, the receiver on the ship is unable to distinguish between the signals of the master and the slave because both are being transmitted at the same frequency, 100 kilohertz. And hence it becomes impossible to determine or ascertain whether the master signal was received for first or the slave signal was received. Now imagine if both of them were transmitting simultaneously in some areas of coverage, the master and the slave signals would actually overlap and it would thus become impossible to even measure the time difference on board. So you can overcome these problems. The Lorenz then transmission format for each station is so arranged that anywhere within the chain where the master signal is always received first followed by the slave signals, whether there are one slave, two slaves, three or four slaves. All right, now this arrangement is achieved by the master transmitting its format first. The slave on receiving the master signals uh, waits for the predetermined time called the coding delay uh, before transmitting its signal format. And then the next slave on receiving the master signal waits for the predetermined time, which is also its own coding delay before transmissions its format and then slave is for the rest of the slaves. So a coding delay is introduced between the master and the slaves. So the coding delay ensures that the master signal always arrives first at the receiver anywhere within the coverage area. So you can see here on your screen, the left hand screen is showing you the transmission without the coding delay. In the right side, you can see the transmission is with the coding delay. Uh, in this case, let's say the coding delay was about 500 microseconds. Now, with the coding delay, there is a no positional ambiguity in the vicinity of the baseline bisection. You can see, right? Although uh, on the left side, where there is a no coding delay, there is a fundamental ambiguity which is existing in the vicinity on both sides of the baseline bisection. So you can see the baseline is the BL stands for baseline. So then the baseline bisection on both sides, there is an ambiguity. Whereas when there is a coding delay and uh, in that case, it's about 500 microseconds, you can see there is no ambiguity in obtaining a line of position. It is much clearer and uh, more accurate in terms of putting the position of the ship at sea.
So you can see here how the slave station, and in this case we used a coding dealer of 1000 microseconds. You can see here how the slave station actually waited for the master to finish its transmission before starting its own transmission. And this is where the coding delay was introduced. And this helps in obtaining a better line of position without any ambiguity. All right, so uh, that was the that was the uh, showing you how the coding delay is introduced. Now, like I said, uh, each chain comprises of a master and a number of stations, and uh, these are called the chains. And chains are identified by their group repetition interval. And this is the time between uh, the start of a master station's group of pulses, as you see on your screen, and the next start of the master station's group of pulses. Now, as you see, the, the GRI or the group repetition interval is expressed in uh, tens of microseconds. Now, it is unique to a particular chain. And in fact, the chain is identified by its group repetition interval. So 9990 could be equal to a group repetition interval of 99,000 microseconds. So for operational purposes, each station does not transmit only one pulse, but in fact, the master transmits about nine pulses and the slave eight pulses each. So the ninth pulse transmitted by the master is spaced at about 2000 microseconds after the eighth pulse and it serves two purposes. Basically, it helps to identify the master signal and it is made to blink if there are transmission errors from one or more stations in the chain and this warns the receiver on the ship or the user on the ship. So the ninth pulse is then not used for navigation. Now if you see the diagram here, the signals from each station are not a single pulse but a series of pulses. All right, so you could say the master signal comprises of nine pulses, each of about 200 microseconds duration, with the first eight pulses at about 1000 microsecond intervals and the ninth at about 2000 microseconds. So the slave signals are identical, except that they do not contain the ninth pulse. So this system will have the advantage where higher energy levels can be transmitted and received over that for a single pulse without increasing the transmitter power. The ninth pulse actually identifies and distinguishes the master signal and the pulses can be omitted to alert the receiver to the fact that an error has developed within the system. Now, now each individual pulse or the individual pulse uh, would be a square wave, but uh, such a pulse would occupy a wider bandwidth that has been then that has been allocated to the Lorentz C. So let me show you what uh, I am talking about here. So you can see here again the time interval between the beginning of one master transmission to the next master transmission, uh, which is known as the group repetition interval is shown. And the explanation that I just provided you is given here uh, with an example as well. So I'll talk about phase coding. Now what happens is uh, phase coding uh, is another problem that is encountered with a Lorentz C pulses. Uh, uh, in that case is that sky wave pulses may get delayed by as much as 1000 microseconds and so might overlap the ground waves mm -hmm. of the next pulse. So to ensure that pulses are not confused at the receiver, each pulse is phase coded plus or minus. That is a normal pulse could be or a normal phase could be plus or an inverted phase could be minus. Now phase coding also aids automatic receivers to identify master and slave stations, each having their own coding. All right. So it is possible to start each individual pulse with either a positive or a negative half cycle. So the positive and negative going waveforms can be transmitted in a specific pattern known as the phase coding. Phase coding provides two advantages and the first is that all the stations in a chain will transmit group, uh, let's say master codes followed by group slave codes in an alternating cycle, therefore assisting in identifying the correct master and slaves of a chain for a time difference measurement. The second is to assist in sky wave rejection. It is possible for sky waves from one pulse to interfere with the ground waves of the following pulse. Now, 
Phase coding allows the receiver to reject this sky wave and prevent error much more successfully than if all the pulses started with the same initial phase. Now what you see here here is a pulse envelope matching. Now in this automatic technique the pulse envelope of the master signal is fed through a variable delay circuit before being compared with the pulse envelope of the secondary station or the slave station required. Now should these two uh, not be perfectly matched then an error voltage is generated. The variable delay circuit further adjusts or delays the master signal until the two pulses are matched and there is no residual error voltage. The amount by which the master pulse has been delayed is then the time difference or the course time difference in microseconds or uh, uh, high values of microseconds. Further accuracy is not possible using this method since precise identification of the leading edge cannot be made due to attenuation of waves or loss of radio energy. The leading edge of the pulses are often attenuated and therefore the Lorentz system uses an identifiable point of reference within the pulse. Because of the loss of energy, the radio waves or the leading edge of the radio waves often uh, are not identified easily. Now the point of reference must be easily and positively identifiable and not contaminated by the sky wave. Now since within coverage only the first 35 microseconds of the ground wave pulse arrives uncontaminated by sky wave, the point of reference used is the third cycle point that is 3 by 10 which equals to 30 microseconds and this meets the criteria. Now this is the method used to achieve a more precise time delay in microseconds and tenths of a microsecond. Since the frequency of transmission is 100 kilohertz, the length of each cycle is 10 microseconds. However, the amplitude of the pulse varies from cycle to cycle within the pulse and this unique feature of the Lorentz pulse is used to identify the third cycle point. Once the third cycle of the master pulse and the third cycle of the slave pulse are identified, the fine comparison can then be made. So you can see here, uh, I am just showing you one of the several techniques used to identify the third cycle. Now here you can see the received master pulse is fed to a storage oscillator. Now one signal is tapped from this oscillator is delayed by 5 microseconds which leads to a 180 degree phase shift. This is called oscillation 1. And another signal is tapped from the storage oscillator is reduced by a factor of 0.84. Let's call it oscillation 2. Now oscillation 1 and 2 are summed algebraically and the resultant oscillation 3 clearly reveals the third cycle sampling point. The same process is applied to the slave signal which is stored in another oscillator to identify its third cycle sampling point. Having identified the third cycle points of both the master and the slave, fine comparison may now be made to get the difference of time or phase and hence microsecond and tenths of a microsecond. Now this is very important like I said because this determines the difference in the transmission time difference between the master and its subsequent slaves. Now of course today with atomic clocks the necessity for the slave station to transmit after pulse trigger is received from the master is no longer needed as the timing sequence is accurately timed anywhere in the world. Now these atomic clocks are the same clocks that are also used for GPSs and they are highly precise clocks and they actually measure the time difference so accurately making the job of the receiver on the ship easy to distinguish between the master and the slave transmission and this difference in the transmission is what converted into a distance and then a subsequent line of position so that you can actually plot the ship's position at sea. So I think this is pretty much it otherwise I will be repeating myself. I will now move on to part three of the videos uh, on Lorentz where I'll talk about the errors of the Lorentz and I'll talk about uh, how to correct those errors of the Lorentz. So otherwise this video will become a bit long and uh, 
you will get a bit bored. So let me know if you have any questions regarding the Lorenzi. Now I was asked to make a videos on Lorenzi and that is why I thought I'll make this video. Uh, for those of you who are not interested in it, don't watch it. Uh, I just thought I should cover this topic as well. Uh, and that will help you to understand how the Lorenzi works. Alright, so I'll uh, leave it now and I'll see you very soon with part 3 of the video.